On a hot September night in 1864, on an island in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, 600 Confederate soldiers huddled inside their cramped A-frame tents as gunfire exploded over their heads. Prisoners of war, the 600 men captured at various battles, had been brought from the Union prison at Fort Delaware to make a point. Their new prison on the beach of Morris Island was within sight of the city of Charleston. It was also within direct line of Confederate Army gunfire. Victims of the madness of a country at war with itself, 600 Confederate POWs were used as human shields by their Union captors, who were also their countrymen. The plight of the 600 Confederate POWs had its roots in a series of events that began one year earlier. In August 1863, the Union Army began firing on the city of Charleston. In an attempt to deter the Union shelling, Confederate Major General Samuel T. Jones, commander of the Department of South Carolina, made a fateful decision. On June 1, 1864, General Jones asked Jefferson Davis's military advisor, General Braxton Bragg, to send him 50 Union prisoners. The enemy continued their bombardment of the city with increased might, damaging private property and endangering the lives of women and children. I can take care of a party of, say, 50 Yankee prisoners to be confined in parts of the city still occupied by citizens, but under enemy fire. General Jones's request was approved, and on June 12, 1864, 50 Union POWs were transferred from Camp Oglethorpe, Georgia, to Charleston, South Carolina. Reporting on the arrival of the Union prisoners, the local paper, the Charleston Mercury, crowed. For some time, it has been known that a batch of Yankee prisoners comprising the highest in rank now in our hands were soon to be brought hither to share in the pleasures of bombardment. These prisoners, we understand, will be furnished with comfortable quarters in that portion of the city most exposed to enemy fire. The commanding officer on Morris Island will be duly notified of the fact of their presence in the Shell District, and if his batteries continue with their wanton and barbarous work, it will be at the peril of the officers. General Jones believed that his maneuver with the Union prisoners would put an end to the shelling of Charleston, and that the Union prisoners would be in no real danger. Instead, it sparked a reaction that had far-reaching effects on the lives of 600 Confederate soldiers. On June 13, 1864, General Jones notified the commanding Union officer, Major General J.G. Foster, of the presence of the Union prisoners by letter. General, five general officers and 45 field officers of the United States Army all of them prisoners of war have been sent to this city for safekeeping. They will be provided with commodious quarters in a part of the city occupied by non-combatants, the majority of whom are women and children. It is proper, however, that I should inform you that it is part of the city which has been for many months exposed to the fire of your guns. Three days later, General Jones received his answer from General Foster. General, I must protest against your action in thus placing defenseless prisoners of war in a position exposed to constant bombardment. It is an indefensible act of cruelty and can be designed only to prevent the continuance of our fire upon Charleston. That city is a city of military supplies. It contains not merely arsenals, but also foundries and factories for the manufacture of munitions of war. To destroy these means of continuing the war is therefore our object of duty. You seek to defeat this effort, not by means known as honorable warfare, by placing unarmed and helpless prisoners under fire. Despite his stated objections to exposing defenseless prisoners to gunfire, General Foster informed Major General Halleck in Washington, D.C. of the situation and made a request of his own. I respectfully ask that an equal number of rebel officers of equal rank may be sent to me in order that I may place them under the enemy's fire as long as our officers are exposed in Charleston. The federal government granted his request. General Halleck wrote to Foster on June 27th 
1864. General, the Secretary of War has directed an equal number of rebel generals and field officers to be sent to you to be treated in the same manner as the enemy treats ours, that is, to be placed in a position where they will be most exposed to the fire of the rebels. The Secretary of War directs on that point you will exercise great vigilance and that the rebel officers will be treated with the same severity that they treat ours. Halleck's letter not only granted Foster's request for 50 POWs to be placed in the line of enemy fire, but also established the idea of retaliation that would guide the treatment of future POWs under Foster's care. Fortunately, the 50 POWs Foster received were never placed in the line of fire. An agreement was worked out, and the Union prisoners under fire in Charleston were exchanged for the Confederate prisoners intended to be placed under fire. Those men were lucky. A misunderstanding would soon put more prisoners on both sides in harm's way. In 1864, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman's Georgia campaign was leading him uncomfortably close to Andersonville, the Confederate-run prison camp. The Confederacy feared that Sherman would free the Union POWs. In order to keep this from happening and to alleviate overcrowding, the Confederate government shipped nearly 600 Union officers and 300 enlisted men to Charleston. They were confined in the city jail, the only available prison. The city jail was in the direct line of Union fire. General Jones begged the Confederacy to remove the prisoners from Charleston because he could not take care of them. His pleas fell on deaf ears. When Union General Foster was informed of the prisoners' presence, he was enraged. Foster believed that these prisoners had been sent to Charleston to serve as human shields. As a retaliatory measure, Foster requested that 600 Confederate prisoners be sent to him at Morris Island to the express purpose of being placed in the direct line of Confederate fire. As before, the federal government agreed to his request. Foster ordered the construction of a Union stockade in front of Battery Wagner on Morris Island. On August 20th, 1864, 600 prisoners were removed from Fort Delaware and herded onto the second deck of the steamship Crescent City. The men were forced to sleep four to a bunk. The heat was unbearable, water was scarce, and many of the men became ill. Captain John Gorman described the trip in his journal. You could hardly turn over when you occupied your position. We were packed as thick as we could lie, and there we had to remain the greater portion of the time, as only those whom the calls of nature demanded were allowed to leave, and, and then only one at a time. The place was as dark as Erebus, and the air soon became as fetid and as poisonous as the Upas. It was a perfect hell, and nearly as hot. The water that was given us was impure, and sometimes the stomach would refuse it from its putrid smell. They fed us twice daily on crackers and raw bacon. To make matters worse, there was only one toilet allotted for the prisoner's use. Because of the length of the line and the degree of illness of the men, Many were forced to relieve themselves in their holding area. The stench was soon unbearable. The 600 prisoners remained on the Crescent City in these conditions for 18 days. Finally, on September 7, 1864, the men were moved into the stockade on Morris Island, which was located in Charleston Harbor within sight of the city. The stockade where the prisoners were to be held was strategically placed so that both cannon fire from the Union guns and the return fire from the Confederate guns blasted over the prisoners' heads. On September 8th, just one day after the 600 men arrived on Morris Island, the Union resumed their shelling of Charleston, and the 600 prisoners began to realize the full impact of their situation. A terrific artillery duel between the Federal batteries and Fort Moultrie commenced about sunset and continued until 10 o'clock. This produced no little excitement amongst the 600 Confederates confined in a space of not more than one or one-half acres. 
tied hands and feet, as it were, without the means of defending ourselves, and knowing not what moment we may be writhing and bleeding under the effects of the bursting of terrible shell. We can say that we are undoubtedly, emphatically, unequivocally under fire. The barbarous work has begun. When shall it end? The shelling soon became just another part of the routine as the prisoners settled into life on Morris Island. A typical day for the men consisted of rising at 6.30 a.m. for roll call, then attending to their assigned duties, which included policing the prison streets and emptying the latrine barrels. Rations were given at 8 a.m. and again at 2 p.m. Taps was at 9 p.m. The rations the men received were known as retaliation rations and were supposed to be similar to those received by Union prisoners at the Andersonville and Salisbury prisons. The rations consisted of three army crackers per day and a half pint of soup. Not only were the rations barely enough to stave off starvation, they were also filled with worms. I have spoken of the lively nature of the bread. Anyone who had not seen it would hardly credit the amount of dead animal matter in the shape of white worms, which was in the mush. For my own part, I was always too hungry to be dainty. Worms, mush, and all went to satisfy the cravings of nature. But I knew of several persons who, attempting to pick them out, having thrown out from 50 to 80 worms, stopped picking them out, not because the worms were all gone, but because the little bit of mush was going with them. Although the rations were minuscule to begin with, they were cut to a quarter of the original amount after several weeks. Added to the reduced rations was a shortage of fresh water, which the men obtained by digging holes in the sand and letting the water seep in. Many of the men became weak or suffered from intestinal disorders. Despite their dire situation, the men did what they could to pass the time and keep their spirits up. They wrote in their journals, read their Bibles, or played chess and checkers. But chess and checkers could only do so much to deter boredom and keep despair at bay. At night, with hunger gnawing at their stomachs and the sound of shells bursting over their heads, the prisoners' thoughts took a darker turn. This has been a day long to be remembered. Starvation has looked us fairly in the face. I have laid down at night and thought, what will I come to? Shall I starve here? They are starving us by degrees, which is a mean thing. Dishonorable in both governments to treat prisoners of war who are so helpless in the way they do. We fight and die for them, and this is the way they treat us? I will never be a military man again as long as I live if I get out of this. I am homesick and want to go home so bad. I've been away from home some long years and would give most anything to see them all. September turned into October, and still the shelling and retaliation rations continued. The Union prisoners confined to the Charleston prison were moved out of Charleston to prisons further inland on October 8, 1864. The 600 Confederate prisoners would have to endure their situation for another two weeks. Finally, the Confederate prisoners were removed from Morris Island on October 21st. In all, they endured 45 days of exposure to shell fire. While imprisoned on Morris Island, four men died of chronic diarrhea, and one man died of wounds received in battle. Amazingly, no prisoners were killed by shellfire, and only a few sustained minor injuries. The 600 men were removed from Morris Island and taken to Fort Pulaski and Hilton Head Island. Thirteen more men died while imprisoned at Fort Pulaski. Eventually, the Union was given permission to exchange the 600 men, but fate and a bureaucratic error played a cruel trick on them. Instead of being released, the men were returned to Fort Delaware, where they remained until the end of the war. 
In 1905, J. Ogden Murray, one of the 600 prisoners, published a memoir about Morris Island. He called it the Immortal 600, the name by which the 600 POWs are known today. November 19th, 1864, Fort Pulaski. Dearest Lizzie, there were 200 of our party called out this morning to go somewhere. But I don't know where, as I am one of the numbers. It may be for an exchange, but I fear it is to some northern prison. My time here is short. Kiss a baby for me and give my love to Ma and Pa. May God help you all and keep you from all harm. I am well. G.W. Routon. After the war, the members of the Immortal 600 returned home to a South that had been devastated, both physically and economically. Many soldiers came home to find their homes had been destroyed during the war, and the jobs they held before the war no longer existed. Just as the South would need to rebuild itself after the war, the members of the Immortal 600 would have to rebuild their lives. One such man was George W. Routon of Sandersville, Georgia. Dearest Lizzie, since I last wrote, we have again moved, but this time not far. We merely moved from tents to barracks. Our quarters are tolerable comfortable. We are not allowed to receive boxes at this time, yet I hope the existing difficulty will soon be removed. If it is not, I will most assuredly have to go naked. My pants is nearly worn out. I make some money by making rings, but have to spend it for other things. Routon enlisted in the 49th Georgia Infantry in March of 1862. He was injured at the Second Battle of Manassas later that year. Routon was taken prisoner at the Battle of the Wilderness in 1864.